As the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, progresses, the Department of Health and Human Services is taking away the religious freedom that all Americans are guaranteed by the First Amendment by requiring that all employers, regardless of religious conscience, provide all forms of contraception to their employees and even to minors without the knowledge of their parents. In response to this assault on the Constitution, Catholic leaders are stepping up and are searching for what can be done within the bounds of the law to deliver quality health care that follows the ethical and religious directives for Catholic health care services. The Make Straight the Pathway Conference was held in Houston, Texas in March of 2013 on the campus of the University of St. Thomas to shed light on the critical problem of providing quality health care and protecting everyone's religious freedoms. I was actually hoping Jonathan would be late so that I could go before him so that then I could claim to be the fourth speaker in a row to quote George Washington. So let me start out with uh, George Washington made this claim in his farewell address. Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness, these firmest props of the duties of men and citizens. The mere politician, equally with the pious man, ought to respect and cherish them. These are words of advice from a wise man, a man formed whose character was formed in war and politics and honor and statesmanship. And he refers to that freedom of religion, which has been so uh, eloquently uh, spoken of here already this morning, that freedom of religion that is uh, enshrined in our First Amendment, um, although it has too often in the past 40 years been interpreted as a freedom from religious expression in, pub in public life. Religious liberty is most properly understood in its larger context as freedom of conscience. The government, government cannot tell you what to believe, nor can it suppress your expression of your religious beliefs, both in words and in deeds. That's the second half, the free exercise thereof provision. The only overriding consideration in the realm of action is a legitimate concern for public safety, the protection of life, the first of our inalienable rights. Recent policies of the current administration have directly challenged this priority, requiring religious beliefs to take a back seat to certain health care policy preferences. While this may not seem at first like a major issue, make no mistake, this is a direct attack on the primacy of individual rights over the state's proper sphere of activity. The state exists, as uh, David so eloquently told us, to protect these God-given rights, not to diminish them. As a layman, Catholic, and citizen, we heed the call of our church to defend the primacy of religious liberty through organized civic action. Our task is to work in the public arena to ensure that religious liberty is fully protected in the law. But we must not accede to the language of debate that would concede the premises prior to the discussion. We are not just against a policy or the constriction of a right. We are for the original and authentic and rich understanding that faith brings to the discussion of rights, inalienable rights as gifts bestowed by nature and nature's God. In discussing the nature of society, the Catechism of the Catholic Church says that, I, and I quote, community is defined by its purpose, end quote, and that the human person is, quote, subject and the end of all social institutions. Later in the Catechism, it states that each human community possesses a common good. This common good is always 
oriented toward the progress of persons. The order of things must be subordinate to the order of persons and not the other way around. This order is founded upon truth, built up in justice, and animated by love. And furthermore, in the Catechism, charity is the greatest social commandment. It respects others and their rights. It requires the practice of justice. And charity alone makes us capable of justice. Charity inspires a life of self-giving. As the Bible says, whoever seeks to gain his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will preserve it. Professor uh, at the University of Dallas, uh, Thomas Yodievics, and I probably did not say that right, I'm not really good at those long Polish names, observed in a recent book review on a collection of essays describing the challenge facing a historian who is also a believer. One of the enduring truisms of Christianity is the Johannine challenge to live in the world but not of it. This simple phrasing is not intended to sound a triumphal blast against one's own age, but rather to encourage, to encourage an engagement with that age while clothed with the armor of Christ so as to witness ultimately to his truth and not that or those of a fallen world. This pronouncement is easy enough in the retelling, but usually a bit more than a bit difficult in the doing. In his uh, recent essay, Defining the Character of a Nation and the Spirit of a Christian, Archbishop Gustavo Garcia Siller of San Antonio says that this land's greatness has always come from its promise of liberty and opportunity. The message of Lady Liberty resonates with the calling of the gospel, for I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Lady Liberty defines the character of a nation and Jesus Christ defines the spirit of a Christian. Catherine Jean Lopez, the editor and editor, an editor at large of National Review uh, Online, in a recent essay titled "The World Needs Real Catholics," offers this insight. People continue to ask, "What happened to the Catholics in November?" I thought they were geared up to save religious liberty. Well, the truth of the matter is that bishops throughout the United States were unprecedented in their opposition to the Obama administration's decision to pick a fight with those opposed to abortion and to violate the consciences of Americans who happen to believe that the use of contraception and sterilization is morally wrong. President Obama's reelection campaign, with a lot of help from the media, did a bang up job of making it an issue of women's health instead of what it is really about, freedom. Never has this debate been about Catholics or other Christians forcing their morality on American women. It continues to be about the religious freedom of Americans not to be compelled to violate their consciences. Freedom is a, a word that we hear a lot and we use a lot. For some, freedom has been warped into forcing employers to provide insurance plans that violate their consciences for the sake of treating fertility as a disease so that women can live by poisonous cultural expectations, expectations that try to suppress the complementarity between men and women, each with unique creative gifts that the world needs. This concept of freedom is false. Freedom is what men die for, ache for, and for which they flee to lands peopled by the good stewards of this God-given gift. If we are serious about this Christ whom we say we follow, freedom is surrender to he who came into the world to save us from sin and death. Mature Christian freedom is my total availability and obedience to the will of the all-wise God. Pope Benedict wrote in his introduction to the year of faith, only through believing then does faith grow and become stronger. There is no other possibility for possessing certitude with regard to one's life apart from this self-abandonment in a continuous crescendo into the hands of a love that seems to grow constantly because it has its origin in God. For that continuous crescendo, we baptized Christians need to go to God. We need to read about God. We need to live lives that are different that show others that being Christian makes a difference. 
George Weigel has noted that John Paul II was the pivotal figure in the collapse of European communism and that he was the greatest Christian witness of the last half of the 20th century. The latter explains the former, which is itself something deeply significant for understanding the cultural dynamics of history. Weigel explained that Blessed John Paul II was completely convinced on the basis of both faith and reason that being a Catholic and being an engaged, compassionate, intelligent human being dedicated to the healing the world's wounds and advancing the cause of human freedom were two sides of the exact same coin. There's a lesson to be learned here for our current day. The world needs what we say we believe. Nothing in this world, Martin Luther King Jr. is quoted, nothing in this world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. Barack Obama wasn't reelected because the bishops didn't do enough. The United States is where we are today, 40 years of legal abortion, a mess of relations between men and women, financial disarray, because Catholics contributed to this state of affairs. And it is going to take a whole lot longer than one year or one election cycle to rebuild an authentic Catholic culture at a time when too many Catholics are secularists too. The Archbishop of Philadelphia, Charles Chaput, um, says this, Europe, Europe's work of reinvention, of self-delusion, has been going on for decades across most of the continent. One of the key obstacles in, the process, in this process is the depth of Europe's Christian roots. As recent popes and many others have pointed out, there really is no Europe without its historic Christian grounding. Anyone wanting a new Europe needs to get rid of the old one first. And so, diminishing Christianity and its influence becomes a priority. And that includes rewriting the narrative on many of Christianity's achievements and heroes. The same could be said of the US if we remain on the path we are currently on. Joshua Mercer, the co-founder of CatholicVote.org, in an essay, To Win Our Culture, Catholics Must Start Telling the Stories, offers this insight. Many Catholics have been, become concerned, if not despondent, about the continued attacks on life, family, and religious liberty in politics today. Some suggest that too much time and money has been spent trying to win political victories, which have proven far too elusive. After all, we mark the 40th anniversary of Roe v. Wade this year. The U.S. Supreme Court this spring could well decide the legal fate of same-sex unions so rashly and inaccurately claiming marriage equality. Faced with this adversity, some have suggested that Catholics should recede from politics altogether and focus instead only on changing the culture. But political surrender would be unwise. Numerous state laws protecting human life um, have been passed in recent years and are now saving lives. Why would we give that up? And why would we enable the enemies of life and marriage to use the full power and resources of the federal government to subsidize abortion? No, we should not quit politics, for it remains an area where we can educate the public, persuade policymakers, and make a difference. But the time has come, he says, for young Catholics to think less about Capitol Hill and more about mass media and the other shaper, major shapers of culture. It's time for Catholics, he suggests, to re-enter the arts, to pen the books that move people, to create characters that people love, to write the songs that make the whole world sing. Think about it. We have national elections every other year and presidential elections every four years, but we engage the culture every single day. It is the TV shows we watch, the books we read, the music we hear on the radio. We cannot allow this entire field of the human experience to be void of Christian insights on love, suffering, redemption, and grace. The time has come to start telling our stories more effectively, 
After all, stories are far more compelling at changing hearts and minds than a pile of statistics and facts. Is it any surprise that Jesus used parables to teach the people of his time and continues to teach us today? Klaus Rinn, a professor at Catholic University of America, stated, Great power for shaping society lies with those who make us see life through their eyes. Deep within our personalities are the marks left by the imaginative and intellectual masterminds. Poets, religious visionaries, painters, composers, and philosophers, the individuals whose intuitions or ideas leave others changed. Directly or indirectly, those individuals create the tenor of an age, for good or ill. They may be long dead, but their visions move the living. Not all of us are artists, but we can all be patrons of the arts. And if we start telling compelling stories about the human experience, we have the ability to change our world for the better. Let us help the world to see life through our eyes, through Catholic eyes. Author Paul Ely laments in his New York Times book review uh, article last Christmas Eve, has fiction lost its faith? He says, today's Christian belief figures into literary fiction only as something between a dead language and a hangover. Where are the successors to Flannery O'Connor and Walker Percy or even a conflicted Graham Greene or obscure J.A.R. Tolkien. Christian faith in today's literature is a strange statue left behind by the former occupants of a home, a parable invoked to reflect a current enigma or a curious factor of one's cultural upbringing that has left an impact most assuredly negative, but offers no enduring truths to invite an adult's assent. To refuse to allow religious belief any explanatory power is to deprive experience of its fullness and may reflect the inability of the modern Christian novelist to make belief believable. That is our task, all of us, to make our belief believable by our words and by our lives. So apropos to this conference, who tells the amazing stories of Catholic health care today? Jerry Filto, in the National Catholic Reporter, two articles in October of 2010, measuring quality of care in Catholic hospitals serve one in six patients in the U.S., reminds us that Catholic health care facilities not only form the largest not-for-profit health service sector in the United States, caring for one-sixth of all U.S. hospital patients every year. They make up 12.4% of the nation's 5,000 community hospitals. They provide 15% of the hospital beds. Uh, the statistics are stunning, but based on public health data, Catholic hospitals also had significantly better quality performance than any other healthcare provider. I could offer similar statistics in the areas of education and social services, two other major areas of public policy. Why do our public policy makers not hear these arguments from us, these stories? Catholics were the leading providers of health care and education and social services long before the modern state undertook these fields of human endeavor. If the church is not the source or creator of these institutions, it was certainly the midwife instrumental in their birth. Why would we allow ourselves to be pushed out of these areas now by the overreaching power of the state? Carl Anderson, in an a, a, um, editorial, Our Moral Responsibility, published in Columbia last, uh, in January of this year, says this, no legal system can be truly committed to human rights if it supports the principle that it is acceptable to intentionally kill the innocent. The responsibility of Catholics remain, remains clear. It is to articulate 
a cogent, consistent understanding of Catholic social teaching in regard to the dignity of the human person, of marriage, and of the family. It is our responsibility to do this in season and out of season, regardless of which political party may benefit. As Catholics, our course must be, must be set by our church's moral compass and not by any partisan political calculation or advantage. And what of us as knights? He was addressing this to the Knights of Columbus, of which he is uh, our head. And what of us knights? We are called to be what our name implies, to be faithful, to be steadfast, to come to the defense of those who cannot defend themselves, and to remain on the field until the field is won. You know, for many years, even growing up, we saw the Church of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, dominating TV advertisement and billboards to shape positively their image. And now, at long last, I saw for the first time recently, Catholics Come Home, an innovative and powerful um, set of uh, television ads with a great message about the accomplishments of the church and welcoming lapsed faithful and other seekers to come home to the church. The Knights of Columbus, organization that I've been proud to belong to my entire life. Uh, when your father is a knight, you're born into the Knights. Um, offers uh, a web, web news service called Catholic Pulse that reaches out daily with attendant blogs. And another website called the Fathers for Good offers a renewed vision of how men can support each other. For decades now, for over 70 years, 60 years, the Catholic Information Service offers free online print and audio explanations of the faith with 76 lessons in three distinct courses on the catechism, on faith formation, and the new evangelization. The Knights of Columbus has been a defender in the courts, both of the church and of Catholic education since the 1920s. It was instrumental in adding the phrase under God as a correct description of our nation in the Pledge of Allegiance. It conducts nationwide nonpartisan voter registration drives and get out the vote programs. It is a current defender with others of public expressions of religious belief in the, in the public sphere, like the various defending memorials to veterans and others that involve religious symbols or religious names. It provides a uh, the matching funding program for placing sonogram machines in Christian pro-life ministries. It is the promoter of Bella and other pro-life movies. And we stand ready to work with all people of faith, as well as those of undiscovered faith, but who are fueled by authentic compassion. This conference represents one of those powerful steps to promote authentic human progress and stave off the overreach of a misguided state. You know, as uh, Ronald Reagan said in his 1983 essay entitled Abortion and the Conscience of a Nation, making a parallel at that time between the abolition of slavery years after the Supreme Court's disastrous decision in Dred Scott v. Stanford to the ongoing efforts then to overturn Roe v. Wade. He says, at first, only a minority of Americans recognized and deplored the moral crisis brought about by denying the full humanity of our black brothers and sisters. But that minority persisted in their vision and finally prevailed. They did it by appealing to the hearts and minds of their countrymen, to the truth of human dignity under God. The sacred value of human life is too deeply ingrained in the hearts of our people to remain suppressed. Let us pray to God that this insight remains true in our time. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jeff Gardner, 
And on behalf of the John Paul II Life Center and the Christus Medicus Foundation, thank you for watching this presentation. The need for more crisis pregnancy centers and Christ-centered medical practices throughout the United States is critical and ongoing, and we'd like to encourage you to get involved. Before you do, there are a couple of important takeaways that we'd like to leave you with. First and foremost, develop a strong and clear vision of what it is you want to create. Be sure that you understand the distinctions between a crisis pregnancy center, a family practice clinic, an OBGYN clinic, a multidisciplinary medical practice, or a sonogram center. Familiarize yourself, too, with the not-for-profit laws as they pertain to health care in your state. John Paul II Life Center operates within the state of Texas. Your laws may vary. Also, before you begin either to explore a crisis pregnancy center or a Christ-centered medical practice, get the blessing of your bishop. Get a committed and unified board. If you can, get the cooperation of your local Catholic hospital. Organize and identify physicians who can be key in helping you getting your project off the ground. Develop a strategic plan, and within it, include the right professionals, those that you'll need to advise you in all aspects of your endeavor. Familiarize yourself with the fundamentals of fundraising, communication, and education. Everyone involved does not need to know how to do everything, but everyone involved should know about everything that needs to be done. To open a Christ-centered medical practice, understand the financial operations of a clinic. When considering the financial arrangements needed to establish a clinic, it has been our experience that the first year costs, including salaries, is a minimum of $500,000 and can be supported by a recruitment agreement for a physician with a cooperating hospital. Also, care should be taken to consult with an appropriate practice management company to assist you in setting up the medical clinic and to get the correct assistance with licensing, credentialing for hospital privileges, and third-party contracts, as well as billing and collections with the best electronic medical records and healthcare information technology available. Right now, a national platform is under development to include a service company that will help take advantage of economies of scale so medical clinics and pro-life centers across the United States can be created. For more information, please contact us at Kimberly at jpiilifecenter.org. That's Kimberly at jpiilife.org. C-E-N-T-E-R dot O-R-G.